We were talking about um, 1 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> we can go back there and, <clears throat> and just look for a moment. Um, Paul talks about, um, like verse 8 and verse 9, now you are full, now you are rich. You have reigned as kings without us, and I would to God you did reign, that we might also reign with you. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. <clears throat> and this thing of being set forth as last. Set forth the apostles last. <clears throat> and he, he, he is sort of using that. I mean, first of all, that's just a, not a common thing to hear in Christianity. It's funny that it's in the Bible, but uh, <clears throat> you don't hear a lot in Christianity. And that is, uh, we hear phrases from Jesus like the first shall be last and the last shall be first, but, we're, but we don't really believe that on a level of, of uh, living <clears throat> because most of the time, most Christians want to be first. They don't want to be last. <laughs> and of course, Jesus really had no problem with, with that. Jesus had no problem with being last. He didn't. And he encouraged his disciples <clears throat> along that way. But, but why, you know? And let's, I want to look at that a little further, why, and then I want to look at how. Um, <clears throat> why would he want us to be last? <laughs> And the answer lies in several different realms. One is that unless we have the nature of Christ, we're not going to be happy with being last. Let's admit it. Can we all say amen to that? Because we want, we want to be first, you know. We want our enemies to be last so that they can look bad, so that we look good, and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so the, the basic teaching of, of Paul about Christ crucified immediately eliminates the old man, the old nature. Shall I say it like that? The old nature, because the old nature doesn't want, doesn't want that. We may think it's us. You know, I, I remember years and years and years ago that the Lord showed me uh, when, I, when I first came to Bible school <clears throat> at Berean, <clears throat> I came in there as a hippie, and it had been an Assembly of God type Bible school. Everybody wore jackets and white shirts and ties and were dressed in suits. And I came with, you know, knee-high moccasin boots with fringe on them and puffy sleeves and the shirt you could see through and, you know, hair down the, you know. <clears throat> and... Uh, one of the reasons why I did that is I wanted to be different. I wanted to be different. And, you know, I didn't want to be like everybody else. You know, I, I just didn't. <clears throat> but the more I began to get into the Word, I realized, you know, the truth is, if, if we're going by the nature of the flesh, if we're going by the old, old nature, we are all the same. We're exactly the same. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Nobody wants any problems in their life. Nobody, you know what I mean? All, I, I mean, all this list started coming that I could go to anybody, regardless of how they looked or whatever, and we were all exactly alike. <laughs> and I saw, you know what? I don't care if you grow your hair long or short, if you do this or you do that. You, you know, you and me have the same fallen nature, and we're not different at all. 
We just have different exteriors. And that was a, I'm going to be honest with you, that was a shock to me. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was. I just was like, no, I'm different. You know, can you see the pride even in that? <laughs> you know. But I was different for Jesus, you know. <laughs> I was a Jesus freak. <clears throat> and um, so uh, the reality, the preaching of Christ crucified immediately cuts out, you know, a huge, vast amount of the human race because they live by the flesh. No one's going to want to go that way. And Paul's already uh, made that clear in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, remember when he said, none knew. If any, if any of the princes had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And, and I just circled two little words in that sentence that said, none knew. None of the princes knew, for had they known... None knew. Nobody knew this wisdom. At that time, only Jesus. And so, um, and, the, and the verse before it says that this was a wisdom hidden before the ages. And it was before the wisdom of this age. <laughs> and I went, oh my God, you know, we're not talking about we're not talking about one Christian choosing this and another Christian choosing that. We're talking about all people and Christ and those who have his nature within them. That's the contrast. It's not, it's not a, well, you know, um, you know, you've heard the story, but when I was in Bible school, the Bible school I went to emphasized becoming a missionary. Everybody was supposed to become a missionary. Well, I didn't want to tell him that I wasn't there to become a missionary because I didn't want to become a missionary. That, that cost too much. Do you, you know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm, I, well, I'm, everything I'm telling you is exactly the truth. I was going, I can't tell anybody I don't want to be a missionary. You know, and you, you know the next line, though, because I've told it before. I want to become a great, mission, uh, great evangelist. <clears throat> Never did become an evangelist, much less a great one, but I did become a missionary. <laughs> <laughs> and lived on the mission field in Jamaica for two years. And so it's like, you know, the Lord gets hold of you, begins to reveal his son in you, and it's no longer you and your wants and your this and that. All of a sudden you're confronted with, do I want Christ? Or do I, you know, am I going to just want my own way? And we all want our own way. So we, at some juncture, we better want Christ, you know what I mean? You know, I mean, that's the, that's the deal. And, and thank God we found from Paul that there are those who, you know, they want Jesus more than they want their own way. And that's not, I just, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I'm belaboring that, but I just know personally that's not an easy leap, you know. I mean, it's like a big chasm. It's not an easy leap. And for me, it's like I barely made it. You ever see these movies where their foot hits the edge and then it slips and they go, and their fingers are like holding on the other side and they <laughs> made the leap and they slowly and they're holding, you know, twigs and things trying to get up. Well, that was me because I, it was like, but you know, I thought, you know, I thought it was some sort of a hippie problem that I had or something. I don't know. I mean, you know, some sort of a weird way of viewing. It was nothing but self. It was nothing but the wisdom of this age. It was nothing but flesh, the old nature. <clears throat> I thought it was personal. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> anyway, so... Let's move on from why to how. <clears throat> how, you know, Paul said that God hath set us forth last of all. Um, like, what is it? <laughs> like a sentence of death. It's the way he put it. But it's, um, God hath set us forth last, as it were, appointed to death. Okay, now we're getting to something good, not just, just how hard it is. <clears throat> and that is, if it's appointed to death in relationship to Christ crucified, there's life out of it. 
Not only that, but there's blessing to others, not just to ourselves. Because let's face it, flesh is primarily self-focused, right? I mean, that's, we all know that. It's, it, it looks inward. It checks everything in relationship to how this is going to bless me or help me or do whatever. <clears throat> but this death <clears throat> becomes worthy <clears throat> um, in that it bears fruit, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, no fruit. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. <clears throat> All right. So I was linking in my mind this word last with, as it were, appointed to death. <clears throat> and I realized that the death in many cases is simply being last. But don't try to subject your flesh to that. Because you, even though you put yourself last, you still greedily and covetously want to be first. And that's right, that is. You know, I don't think these things are hard, should be hard for any of us. All we got to do is just face the facts, and we know we're all exactly the same. This is who we are. <clears throat> but when, the, when it's no longer just a teaching from 10,000 instructors, but it begins to be fathered into us, we have the life of it, and we can do it because it's not hard. It's the Lord. Do you understand? I mean, there's more life than there is the external of whatever our flesh is crying out for. And that is, the, by the way, the advantage of the cross is I am crucified with Christ. There has to be that death before you're ever going to walk in the death relating to Christ crucified. Two different things, and I'm not going to try to explain all that right now. And I have actually in one of the other classes a little bit. Um, so I'm trying to get to a point here. And my point is that this thing of being last, whether in honor, which being last means dishonor, or strength, and being last means the weakest. <laughs> I mean, that's the way Paul was describing it. <clears throat> and so, the Holy Spirit today brought me to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And I want to just give you a little example of this, <clears throat> that what we're talking about right here. John, chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 1. John, chapter 14. <clears throat> Verse 1. This is Jesus speaking here to his disciples, and he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. Here Jesus is speaking some incredible words of comfort to his disciples. They're more, they're more incredible than we realize in this. While he's speaking this, this is happening on the same day that he's going to be taken by the Pharisees and scribes and all those guys. It's the same day. <clears throat> okay? And... Um, in a certain sense, you know, you could say he is literally moments away from all of the agonies that he's going to experience at the cross, um, at the trial. Um, and of course, since he's God, he has foreknowledge. And in his foreknowledge, he knows that he's going to be betrayed by one of his own for money. Uh, that Israel is going to turn on him. And <clears throat> that even though he's really, uh, all that's going to happen, you know, even though he's really done nothing but good for people. <clears throat> and he is well aware of that. And one way you can see this is 
uh, verse 14, verse 1, if you back up, because remember, these actually were letters, so they don't have chapters and verses. So we're talking about the next sentence before this. You following me? So let's go to chapter 13, verse 38, which is the next sentence before this in the letter. In fact, you could go... Uh, <clears throat> Verse 37, Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answering him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The, co the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. <clears throat> All right. The first thing to realize from that is the next, uh, the, facing you know, he already knows Judas is going to betray him. Now he's facing dealing with the situation, not, not just aware of it. He's de it's in his face. Peter, you're going to betray me, you know, okay? Next words. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid, <clears throat> troubled, or uh, believe in God. Believe also in me. And, the spirit in which he is um, delivering these words, I believe, and I'll explain it in just a second, I believe is the spirit of being last, even appointed for death. And what that means, I'll, I'll explain it in just a second. <clears throat> Keep your place here, but I want to look at one other verse that sort of says the same thing that we just read, but that's in Mark, chapter 14, Gospel of Mark. Um, verse 26, and this is after the Lord's Supper and just before these events. Um, Verse 26, Mark 14, 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, you do remember that the Mount of Olives is where he prays, not my will but thine be done. And that's also the place that they show up with torches and everything to take him away, to be crucified. Do y'all do realize that, right? Okay. Well, just before they went out there, they all sat around and sang a hymn. They're singing to the Lord. <laughs> all right. And then, verse 27, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. And Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will I not. Or not I. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, This day, even in this night. I'd never noticed that before. <laughs> I've always said, This day you will betray. He goes, Jesus goes, This day, even this night, right now. Um, before the cock crows thrice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Or twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. But he spoke the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any way. Likewise also said they all. <clears throat> all right. So back to John. So that's the events that happened just prior to Jesus' words in John 14, 1. You get it? That's what was in his face. And he's going, Peter, I'm telling you, this day, this night, right now, the night we're in, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you're going to deny me. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. That's his next words after that. <clears throat> he's aware of what he's about to face, and um, he knows that part of what he's going to be facing is a trial. And in that trial, there's going to be False accusations against him. Lies. 
said about him publicly to sway people against him. Okay, are you following? I mean, if nothing else, picture yourself in a situation like that. It's, it'd be real hard. <clears throat> and uh, as he said already, he knows that his disciples, his own disciples, that they're going to run away. And he knows that his chief disciple, Peter, is going to deny him. Not once, not twice, three times, not tomorrow, not next month, but tonight. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. And he knows the horrible treatment that's uh, about to happen and the terrible death. And it's, it's going to be something he's going to experience. It's going to be something he has to go through. <clears throat> and even though that's going on, I mean, though he's just moments away, and he's moments away not just from the worst day of his life, but the worst day in history ever. <clears throat> he turns to his own disciples and he begins to comfort them. He, he's thinking about them. He's thinking about what they're going to go through during this time period. And he says words to them to help them get through it and get through this whole ordeal that's about to take place because they're going to be facing stuff too. <clears throat> and um, of course, you know, the truth is whatever the disciples are going to go through, and they will go through it. I mean, think about Peter denying the Lord and then, you know, seeing his face later. Think about the whole situation of all of them running away. Um, but whatever they go through, it's not going to be anything compared to what Jesus is about to face. But Jesus is working to soften the blow for them. That's his spirit, and that's his way. <clears throat> and, you know, he's not, um, he, he could have gone into self-pity. He could have tried to get, you know, sometimes when, when you go through something, uh, most of the time, if you're going through something with, against someone else, and I'll use that word again, and they're against you, both sides will try to get as, people, as many people on their side as they can. And that's a, that's a common thing. And if they're winning, which I've been writing on winning lately, and it's nothing like what we think. But anyway, if they're winning, meaning they've got 15 people on their side, uh, um, you might be desperate just to have one. You want more than one, but you've got to have one. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You've got to have one. So you've got to go to somebody and tell them you're your thing. And you got to tell it in such a way that, you know, they pity you and you look like the victim and on and on and on. You know. I don't need to explain this to any of us. We're all Adam and we all know. <laughs> um, but Jesus was set forth last as it were, appointed to death. And that death is already happening, if you will, in that he's not carrying on about his situation. He'll spend the next three chapters lifting them up, talking to them about what's coming in a good way. And then the 17th chapter, praying for him. <laughs> I mean, these guys never did lay hands on him and pray for him. You know, they couldn't even stay awake while he was praying. You know, he had to go wake them up twice. <laughs> and um, 
from, from this, from this, what I see is Jesus becoming last. Um, his worries, fears, we don't hear about them. They were placed last. And his concerns over the horrible treatment that's about to happen to him, it's placed last. His, his, his spirit and his nature is to look at his disciples and to think, this, I just hate what they're going to have to go through. You know, I just hate, and I want to comfort them. And he doesn't send up a little red flag that goes, you know, anybody catching on that this is going to be really rough on me? <clears throat> now, I happen to know personally that that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. There is something in you that wants to say something at least to somebody. <laughs> I know. It's like, I don't want everybody to think I'm, you know, despised and rejected and a criminal and, you know, I, I, I can't live with that. <laughs> and so, um, uh, interestingly enough, if you go to that someone, a lot of times they're all caught up in what they're going through. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen Seinfeld, the, the show, comedian, comedy thing, but they're all sitting at a restaurant, and this go, happens over and over and over again. There's three of them or four of them. Kramer's there, whatever. They're all there, and they one will say a sentence about one thing, and the other one will respond with a sentence about what they're thinking about has nothing to do with what this person just said. And the other one will say something about where they're at. And the first person who said something will follow with another thing about what they were thinking about. And the other person will chime in with theirs. And it's a conversation, but nobody's talking to one another. <laughs> you know? And it's like, I don't want to go to this restaurant. Because every time we do, we, but they do it apart from the restaurant. But that, it's, it's just a weird deal, but it really... Uh, shows how self-focused we are and that we can't even really hear someone else because we're so self-focused. Jesus is not that way. Jesus is not that way. And uh, let me show you one thing back and just just occurred to me. I think the Holy Spirit just reminded me this second. In 1 Corinthians 4, <clears throat> Um, let's, re uh, let's read through this again, and then I want to show you a verse that uh, I've mentioned, but I haven't said a whole lot on. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's read verse 9 again. For I think that God, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Here's the verse I want you to see, verse 14. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm not telling you these things to focus on me or to think I'm something. That's not why I'm writing this. I'm writing this for your sake. He says, you, he's basically saying, you're the one who wants to reign as kings. You're the one that are wise. You're the ones that are strong. And I'm writing this to warn you, um, not to prove that I'm, you know, really somebody or I should be pitied, uh, you know, for the stuff we've gone through to help you. I'm not writing this for that cause. 
I write this to you as my beloved sons. Just in the same spirit that Jesus turns after, and, and uh, you know, Mark is pretty good when it says that last phrase just before it goes into that. But, but Peter wouldn't have none of it when Jesus said, you know, you're going to deny, I will die for you. What do you mean? I will, you know, I will die for you. And then it says, and so said they all. <laughs> Next words, of course, in John. Let not your hearts be troubled, because you are going to fail. But his spirit, Paul's spirit here is like Jesus. It's Christ in him. It's Christ crucified in him. And he's really, really okay with being last. Um, you've heard me use the phrase before, you know, about, you know, being in a barrel and people pushing others down so that they can climb on top of them to get to the top, you know. And the Lord dealt with me years ago and told me, um, you know what, the best position you can be in is at the bottom of the barrel because you can help push others up. If you're way higher than them, you're not going to really, really be able to help them. First of all, you're too high for them. Just get down there and get in the position where you can push them up and let that be your joy. Well, you know, nice words. But it can only be your joy if it's Christ crucified. I mean, that's the truth. It can't be your joy just by being Christian. You have to have your mind renewed to the wisdom of God in a mystery. You have to. And, that, and Paul described that as Christ crucified. And so um, th there is this place that Jesus goes to always because it's who he is. He's just, you know, he's just trying to explain to them, look, all of you are going to, this is what you're going to do because this is who you are right now. This is, you're going to run away, you're going to hide, you're going to self-protect, and you're not going to be anywhere near me for what I, you know, for this whole thing. And, of course, then Peter's words are, you know, no, no, uh, uh, man, I am with you, Jesus. That's your normal, modern-day Christian concept that we're with Jesus. We are not with Jesus in this kind of stuff because we don't want to be last. We want to be first. Okay. Well, they... You have to remember this. They couldn't be anything else at that moment. It wasn't until the resurrection that the church began. Well, it wasn't even then. It was the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and the church began. And the Holy Spirit, uh, and, and <clears throat> I don't know, one day I'll share with you some of the stuff the Lord has shared with me on the Holy Spirit in relationship to Christ crucified. But it's just phenomenal throughout the New Testament. Um, but the Holy Spirit comes to impart living reality. He's God. He knows God. And we've been made one. He's not just instructing. We've been made one. And he's got every right to, sh as it were, if we're a branch, to shove Christ into our little branch, <laughs> our little twig. You know, so that his fruit starts popping out of our little twig, you know. And, and so he, do, and he does that, and he will do that if we'll let him, if we don't get some sort of concept that the Holy Spirit is here to make us get goosebumps and shout and, you know, think that everything's wonderful when we're still, we will still run from the cross. <clears throat> um, so... So Jesus isn't condemning them when he says, all of you are going to run. And he's not. Paul wasn't condemning them when he was saying, you want to be strong, but we are weak. You want to be wise when we're foolish. 
He says, as my beloved sons, I'm warning you. That's not the wisdom of God. It's not the way of God, you know. And I'll just close with this, and that is that, again, I said in the last class, we say, well, I'm Baptist, so I don't believe that way. Or I'm, you know, I'm not picking on Baptist. I'm Methodist, or I'm Episcopal, or I'm Presbyterian, or I'm whatever, you know. So I don't believe that way. Well, it really doesn't matter. First, I'll just say it. It doesn't matter what you believe, and it doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't. Doesn't matter what we teach in this place. Doesn't matter if we believe this and da 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 da. The only thing that really matters is what does the word say? And do we, you know, let's, now let's clarify that. <laughs> because all of those have founded it on the word. And do we see the heart of God, not just the hands of God? Do we see God instead of his works? And Israel, uh, what, it, what does it say? I think it's in Psalm 106 or something. It says, Israel saw my works, but they do not know my ways. Oh. Remember last class what Paul said? I'm sending my beloved son that he may put you in remembrance of my ways, which are in Christ, which are what he's talking about here. So, um, I, was, I was just moved by this thing in John 14. I was moved to see no semblance of struggle within him to just move those issues right out of his heart no semblance of struggle to go, you know what? I need to be here for you. Realizing that probably not at any juncture when he walked with them for those three and a half years did they ever really, really think about him. He was feeding them, he was doing miracles, he was working for people. Uh, you know, he's always pouring out. He, uh, you, you remember the story where word came to Jesus that John the Baptist, his cousin, by the way, John the Baptist was his cousin, had been killed by Herod. The verse continues to say he went out in, to a mountain place, I think it was, to be alone. Now, he's, now he genuinely is alone in this message and this reality in the earth. <clears throat> And then the disciples came to him and said, all the multitudes are looking for you and they're hungry and they're, you know, they're needy and all of the sick. And, and I wrote a song about it a long time ago. Most of you don't know it, but many, some of the great rock band type people do know the song. But, but I wrote that song based on those kind of scriptures where I saw Jesus walking through the multitudes and I saw a million arms. I mean, I could draw a picture of this. A million arms, and some of them have hold of his garment, and others are, you know, just pulling on his hair, trying to get him to stop, and others are, and he's just, they're just all over him, and he's just trying, he's passing through, and the, everyone is aware, every arm and every touch is a selfish touch. Me, 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 you know. And he says, and the multitude came to him and he healed them all. <laughs> That's Jesus. And see, we just go, oh, it's a miracle. He heals, he heals everybody. Well, there's a greater miracle. He didn't kill them all. <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, he didn't say, you selfish, self-centered things. And, 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 and I, I'm to close with this but you know a lot of times he won't confront you and say you're just being selfish because he's being too busy being selfless so he won't you know so we're going well if the lord and i know this because i i did this for a while so you know so i keep I, I was walking and going okay well if the lord wants to change me or something or deal with me he'll deal with me in the meantime i'm just going to be 
you know. And I'll just wait on God. Well, you know, what if he's waiting on us? You know. And um, so it's like, okay, a journey that could have taken uh, two weeks at the end of it, me going, you know, Lord, you know, help me. I'm, I'm a mess. Took two years or ten years while we are waiting for God to deal with us and, and he's so busy being selfless that it's covering up how really selfish we are. I mean, is this making sense? I mean, I hope it is. I don't, I, you know, I'm just telling you what I went through. <laughs> and, you know, and it was very hurtful for me um, to discover that I thought I was very close to the Lord and I was a parasite. I'm talking about me now. I'm not, I would never call you a parasite. And that's, but I was. I was, a, I was like a parasite sucking off of Jesus what I could get, <clears throat> but never putting anything back in, in the sense of what is, what's going on in you? You know, all the prayers were, here's what's going on with me. You know, so my prayer life was self-centered and my ministry was self-centered and my personal life was self-centered and everything was, and when he didn't deliver when I thought he would, meaning on time, I'd get upset with him. <clears throat> well, to put it in nice words, I was a piece of work. So anyway, um, that, was, that was what I got out of John 14, just how he just, man, I mean, it's like he's confronted Peter saying, I'm going to do this, and Jesus knows he's going to fail him. He knows Judas has already gone out and is doing the deal, and he just immediately turns, and the spirit, I'm, I'm talking about a spirit change in that gathering where he just says, let not your heart be troubled. What I'm doing, I'm doing for you. I will do for you. I'm thinking about you. And I'm not demanding you think about me, though we should, because that's love. That's the way love works. <clears throat> but he never takes that into consideration. He just gives, and he 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 gives, because he's a giver, because he's selfless. He's a giver. And I just got tired of... I just got tired of being a taker all the time. I wanted Jesus to get some sort of, you know, I, I see that woman that broke the alabaster box on his feet and the disciples going, why are you wasting this? And Jesus is going, let her alone, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, it's about the only thing I, I've got here, you know. Let's close. Father, we just thank you for your spirit and Lord, Again, my words, may they not be emotion charged or may they not be anything but just true and may they be like arrows to find the hearts of those who are ready and want to hear them. And for those that are not mature or not ready, Father, um, I'm with you. Uh, we, we are in this together. And so, Father, I just pray that you will um, open all of our hearts that hunger to know Christ crucified in a true and living way. And may this world be different as a result of those who embrace, embrace life out of death. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.